Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. Meet a local piano virtuoso and learn about his mission to educate others about the enjoyment of classical music. See how the worldwide sport of water skiing began right here in our home state of Minnesota. Climb aboard on a special bus ride as it picks up kids on a sunny Sunday morning. It's all just ahead, off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Ian Chapinski was born into a family of musicians. Both his mother and father were professional musicians and teachers. From the start, Ian knew his life would revolve around the piano. After receiving his Bachelor of Music and Master's of Science degrees from Juilliard, Ian embarked on tours that took him across the country and throughout Europe. Today, he strives to generate the recognition and the acceptance of classical music. I try to be one of those voices that adds something to life. I think my destiny is just to play beautiful music to people everywhere and have them hear another way of, of saying and performing these beautiful pieces. Well, people ask me uh, how I got to Austin and I tell them I drove here. My name is Ian Chapinski. I'm a pianist. I was born in New York City. I grew up in Long Island, in Levittown. And started studying piano when I was seven. And also started playing baseball. I had several good teachers, and then I got accepted at the Juilliard School in college when I was 15, where I got two degrees from Juilliard. My father, may he rest in peace, is Aaron Chapinski. He was a great cellist and a wonderful human being. My mom is still alive. She's a cellist too. My father was a wonderful person and a great cellist, and just a, also a great sense of humor. He taught me a lot about performing. He, he was first cellist with many of the famous conductors. We were a team doing cello piano recitals. Wonderful experience. I played cello in the high school orchestra, but I couldn't, I couldn't really manage with the cello. It was uncomfortable. I couldn't play it right. And actually, I'm glad I did because it, it gave me a, you know, a team with my father. My father wanted to do a concert in New York and he hired a, a woman named Rita and the concert went really badly. And so they, they looked at me and said, uh, they offered me the job for the next one. And uh, I got a wonderful review when I was 17 in New York City in a big concert hall. And that started it all for playing with my dad. We had a lot of fun together. We went to Europe together. We toured in Europe too. And uh, my mother didn't come on those trips. So I, I got a chance also to know my father very well. I went to Europe for about 25 years, almost every month in Europe playing concerts and coming back. Well, in 1982, I was at a shell station near Kennedy Airport in Long Island. And when the owner decided, uh, knew that I was a pianist, he asked me whether I'd like to play a concert there. It was like all these bays on the gas station were full with chairs. The gas station was absolutely packed to the gills. They had to turn away people. It was one of the most enjoyable concerts I ever gave.
I had met some people in Iowa. I played in Iowa in 80, 81, 82, and I wanted to play more in the Midwest. And some people recommended me to play in Minnesota. I was hired to play at Manderville, the Opera House, and unfortunately my dad passed away while I was there. So I did not cancel, I played three concerts upon his passing and dedicated them to him. That's why I can never forget the Minnesota and the Midwest. I left New York and I decided to come out here. Uh, I have twin daughters and I wanted to raise them in a good community. Well, for the concert I just gave at Austin and at the Charter House, I chose a piece full of piano acrobatics, great virtuoso pieces which are so demanding of the pianist, both as a human being and as a performer, that very few people in the world would want to play this kind of program. I played them in the Charter House for 20, 30 years. I started playing it 30 years ago. They have their own built-in audience. People come in the building and they come down and hear it, and many of them know me for many years, and they're almost always there. Well, the Chopin Nocturne is a, a night piece, and it's one of the most beautiful nocturnes ever composed by anybody. I try to put it in a very dreamy style, um, sprinkle it with a little passion and pizzazz, but basically very colorfully uh, gentle and beautiful. It was important to go to Juilliard because, for me, it was an inspiration. When I walked into the building eight, nine o'clock in the morning, I heard, for example, a large portion of the piano literature played magnificently, being practiced every morning. And that inspiration helped me work hard, too. I think it was the most enjoyable atmosphere I ever had. I mean, you could be an oddball like everybody else there. I come from a family of many generations of music and painting. So in my house, when I was a kid, I had all these wild abstract paintings on the wall. And I grew up with abstract, it was just, just the normal part of life. You know, it was wild, but all these crazy wild lines and colors all over the place. I think it does something for your mind. It helps open up your mind to say, this is all part of life too. My favorite type of uh, pop music is actually Brazilian music, the Latin style with all these wild rhythms and bossa nova and, and all those things. Well, I think the idea that music, art, and gym are electives, not subjects, is a mistake. I believe that these are three crucial areas which should be done more, and they should have the respect of being an equal subject to English or history or math. In many ways, the performers are like servants of the composers. We didn't write this stuff. And it's our job to do a good job for the composer and follow his directions and use our little creativity to make it our own style. It takes a long time to play the piano. You have to develop your fingers, your mind, your eyes, your ears. There are all these senses, all these four senses work together. and. It takes a long time to be able to play anything really nicely. 
The reward is hearing some applause and some smiles from people you don't even know. Lake Pepin was formed by a widening of the Mississippi River. It rests on the shores of Lake City, Minnesota. It is here that the sport of water skiing was invented. In the early part of the 20th century, a clever young thrill seeker named Ralph Samuelson decided to combine snow skiing with his love for the water, and water skiing was born. I travel the world, and one of the things I, I tell people when they ask me where I live is I tell them I live where water skiing was invented. And they said, where's that? And I'll say Lake City, Minnesota, and they automatically say, isn't it cold there? Isn't it frozen there? <laughs> and so uh, it really uh, was one of the things that uh, made me interested in finding out personally how this happened. So I'm Jeff Kuznia, and I reenact Ralph Samuelson, who is the gentleman who invented water skiing back in 1922. Ralph was an uh, adventuresome child and grew up in Lake City. He enjoyed being in the water. And he said, I can snow ski, so why can't I ski? Here on the water. So the story is that he started by doing the same thing he did when he was snow skiing. He was starting off with barrel staves. So he put the barrel staves on and his brother Ben uh, tried pulling him up on the barrel staves and uh, of course he went right down to the bottom of the lake. So then he tried snow skis, figuring they were longer uh, and uh, they would float better and the same thing, he went right down to the bottom of the lake. So he realized that this wasn't going to work. He had to come up with something else. So he went down to the lumber yard and got two eight-foot boards. And he took the boards and figured that he should curve the tips like the snow skis were. So he took the boards, put them into his mother's copper uh, laundry kettle, uh, heated them up, got them into hot boiling water, softened them up, and then he clamped them so that they would curve. Then he went and got some leather straps, put those on the boards, and his sister, and he uh, painted them white, and he took them down to the lake. So he had really 100 feet of rope behind the boat, and an iron ring that he was holding on to. And so he stood in the water with the skis and Ben hit the uh, accelerator on the boat, took off and uh, Ralph went right to the bottom of the lake again. So something wasn't quite right. And he said, let's try this again. And thought, okay, maybe if I keep the tips of the skis the boards out of the water that that would help. He got down into the water, squatted down with the tips pointed up. His brother uh, then took off and pulled him up. Now this was July 2nd, 1922, at about four o'clock in the afternoon. And he was 18 years old. Uh, his birthday was July 3rd, so it was right before he turned 19. It really was something that he wasn't expecting to really become famous for, but it was something that he really enjoyed the applause for. He enjoyed the attention. Uh, before long, on weekends, they were doing water ski shows. The first water ski shows in the world were done right here in Lake City. 
I would say water skiing was probably invented in Minnesota by Ralph Samuelson because of the man himself, who was very innovative and creative. Some of the best water skiers in the nation actually come from the Midwest. And uh, I guess my thoughts on that are that in the South, we can always ski tomorrow. In the Midwest, when the sun shines, we go, we play, and we play hard. Oh yeah, it's exciting. Especially when you get like more experienced and you can jump and move around better. Uh, I like skiing, I don't know, it's like coming out in the lake, you know, it's a sunshiny day and it's hot and you just go out the lake and with your friends and just have fun and kind of goof around and try new stuff and you know, you're going to fall and fail just like anything else and you just kind of get back up and it's just something new to explore, I guess. Yeah, I plan on keep skiing, you know, the rest of my life, kind of pass it on to my family and just kind of keep the tradition going because it's just a fun thing to do. When you put a lot, a lot of people with boats on lakes and you put uh, young, adventuresome kids in those lakes, they're going to do crazy things. And I think uh, it just happened that the intersection of the crazy kid, the water, and the boat occurred here. On Sunday mornings, you may have noticed a bus traveling down your street picking up school children, even though it isn't a school day. That bus is part of a bus ministry. The bus ministry is designed to provide transportation to people who would not otherwise be able to come to church. It's been called one of the greatest evangelistic tools in the history of the local church. Ride along with Pastor Bernie Bolt on his route to bring kids to the Oakland Baptist Church. The bus ministry is, is something that, that you have to work at and, and look for uh, needs, look for the kids and just be willing to knock on a door and ask a question. And uh, if there's children there and sometimes they will gladly come along. The phenomenon of bus ministries is the idea that you would use people within the ministry to reach into the homes and many times children are a good way into a home. Uh, many times you can have um, activities for children and the parents are more than happy to let their children leave for a couple hours to be able to go to a safe environment. So kids are a good avenue into a home. When we leave church, we head into Austin, and uh, we look for the most ec economical route, uh, you know, where kids live to try to save the fuel and, and, uh, and, and efficient for timing to be able to get back out to church in a, in a quick fashion. And then we just pull up the houses and get out and knock on doors and, and see who's awake, see who we need to wake up or help get them ready. And so we've, we've been known to sit in front of homes for a few minutes waiting for them because they want to come but they're not quite ready yet.
Many times through our bus minister, we're able to help give families something that they may need. If it's if the child may need some boots or hats or gloves or things, so some of those physical needs, uh, we have the availability to know that they have those needs because of our bus ministry and the visiting those homes that we do on a regular basis. I do not know of another church in Austin with a bus ministry in the way that we run a bus ministry. I do see many vans and uh, courtesy vehicles that go out uh, to pick up uh, people uh, with various needs. Um, but in the capacity of a bus ministry, um, I have not seen another one in Austin. The church here is funded primarily by the members that go there and, and there is no other outside source of income. So the bus ministry is funded simply through the uh, giving of the members of the church. When a child comes, they're going to learn the Bible, they're going to learn the gospel, uh, and when they leave, they are going to have heard the formula for living a life that will be successful. Um, but th that doesn't always happen, but yet we know that our goal is to give them those tools to use, and we believe that we do that. I'm a senior at Austin High School, and I've been coming to Oakland Baptist for about 10 years. I like it, it's like a friendly and family environment. So it's like, it's really homey here, I guess. The people here, they they interact with you and they're really nice. They're always there for you regardless. So it's like, I don't know, they're, just, they're like a, what a family member is. Oakland Baptist Church is represented by a number of ethnic groups. Obviously the local uh, Minnesotan farmer. We also have a group of people from the Karen state of Myanmar, and so they are a people group are oppressed uh, by the government and uh, have fled into Thailand and have come uh, to the United States. Uh, we also have uh, some that I believe them to be Sudanese refugees uh, from South Sudan. Uh, and there is war zone there, and so they have fled to Ethiopia for refuge and uh, have come over from there. We come from Sudan, through Kenya, Nairobi. Well, there was, uh, the war broke out in, uh, in Sudan in 1983 the people to go come to Ethiopia. After Ethiopia, the regime changed, happened in 1991, and then we went to Nairobi, Kenya. As a refugee, we get a, like a visa from the State Department. You can't stay in a refugee camp for all of your life. So, like, uh, maybe the United Nations asked like, USA, Canada, Australia, or Scandinavian countries who were willing to take some privileges, and then they came and gave us some applications. That time we were we, we kind of looking for jobs, and then they told us that uh, there's a company in Austin. So, you know, when they come and talk to the kids, sometimes, you know, they talk to us. So it's kind of interesting, so that I decided, you know, to come to church, to join them. So. There are many cultures who are moving into Austin for work, but they are they are coming from a very um, poor and uh, war-filled background that has caused major oppression. From what my understanding is of Scripture, there is one race, and that's the human race. So I don't see color, I see needs. The bus ministry in my life has been uh, a learning experience like no other.
Do you wake up every Sunday morning uh, wanting to run out into the sub-zero temperatures to be able to pick kids up? Well, not always. Uh, you know, in the rain, you know, and all of those kinds of things, is it always your favorite? No. Uh, but in the end, you're able to bring them into the church to see their smiling faces, uh, to, to be able to, uh, to see the joy that they receive because of the love that is so easy to share with them. Uh, it just makes, makes you want to do it every day of the week if you could. That's all for this episode. Please help Off 90 meet its financial obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call, 800-658-2539, or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time, Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota.